Great. Well, thanks everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's definitely not the same as being all together. And I want to thank Don uh, for uh, inviting me back. And um, so I just thought over the next couple of minutes, just highlight some of the, the key pointers here. I think that um, definitely some different nuances when we think about cervical deformity, um, different from arthroplasty and ACDF. And I'm just going to highlight uh, some of these, uh, these challenges here. So here's a case, a uh, patient that I uh, took care of um, within the last uh, six months or so. It's an older woman that comes in with progressive myelopathy. And you can see on the MRI on the left, uh, you know, she's got pretty severe cord compression stenosis across a cervical thoracic junction. And uh, there's definitely this abnormality in the alignment of the vertebral bodies there. Uh, between C3 and C6. Um, the CT in the middle shows a lot better, the, the bony configuration. There. And you know, she's so myelopathic and has such horrible neck pain and is unable to keep her head up, she can't even sit up for an upright x-ray or let alone stand. So we sort of put together this patchwork um, lateral scoliosis x-ray and you can see here it's impossible to see right the shoulders are kind of in the way they're almost up to the level of the uh, the ears and it's really hard to assess you know what is this patient's alignment what are the goals here um, you know even if you wanted to just address that pathology at C7T1 uh, I think we could argue and debate what's the right approach and someone maybe in their 60s 70s would you Put that person through an anterior approach, a combined approach, a laminoplasty, laminectomy, laminectomy fusion, but then what do you do about that area with the horrible sort of deformity and subluxation between C3 and C6? So these are not easy. So when we look at um, posterior cervical fusion, we can see that uh, de depending on whatever database you're looking at, it's definitely on the rise here. Uh, you can see over the last decade, two decades, um, and this may be partly because of technology and industry. We just have better tools. Um, you know, laminectomy and laminoplasty are not the only options. So in the U.S., at least, we're seeing this market rise in the utilization of, of hardware. Not only that, though, we're seeing when you look at the CPT codes uh, beyond, you know, 22842 and instrumentation, when you look at the osteotomy codes, those are also uh, taking off as well over the last several years. So there's definitely, you know, through different uh, commercial uh, pairs, you're seeing a definite rise in these uh, posterior osteotomy codes, whether it's just posterior element or three column osteotomy. We know there's a lot of literature sh pretty much showing and telling us now that uh, the alignment in the cervical spine is correlated with uh, long-term patient outcomes, including pain and also myelopathy scores. And this is just one highly cited paper uh, that was, I think, one of the first papers that actually looked at the relationship between the cervical SVA between C2 and C7 and the NDI. And other investigators have done the same thing uh, with prospective uh, studies, uh, doing the same for cervical myelopathy. So we know now to be more mindful of this. And uh, when we assess these patients, you know, I think when patients come in with horrible stenosis and myelopathy, most of the time, I think if they have moderate to severe symptoms with some progression, we're all inclined to treat that patient, but oftentimes it becomes a matter of how, how to do it, not necessarily when. Post-laminectomy kyphosis is a, major, it's, it's a real problem. Um, probably, I think, you know, to some degree, it happens more, I think, in neurosurgery than maybe orthopedics. Uh, there are a lot of conditions in neurosurgery where we do laminectomy and not necessarily instrument if a patient has an integral tumor, spinal cord tumor, schwannoma, uh, sometimes we can get away without instrumenting. But the repercussions, the, the, sort of the implications of that can be significant. I think most of us, if not all, have seen this in our practices. And how does that translate? Well, it translates to that patient having a harder time keep their head up and that chin starts to jut forward the trapezius muscles get really hypertrophied and it looks like they've just been doing uh, like um, shoulder exercises. Uh, but, you know, in older patients, you know, you know, they're not hitting the gym and, uh, and doing reps over and over, but that's what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. This is one patient who- Hey guys, thanks for watching. To continue, please log in or create an account for free. Thank you for your support.